18. Semester one was relatively short. Semester two is going to be a relatively longer one. So we're going to have eight or nine weeks worth of material. Over the first three weeks, we're going to be having a look at the thoracic cage. We're going to be having a look at the shoulder girdle. The shoulder girdle is going to be divided into two subtopics. Um, it's kind of a hard area to divide up. So what we're going to do is next week, we're going to be having a look at the humerus and clavicle. In academic week three, we're going to be having a look at the rest of the shoulder girdle and the shoulder joint itself. Um, the notes for that are going to be available later today. Thank you for your patience on that. I've been doing a little touch of updating just so the notes are as meaningful and up to date as they can be. So let's talk about the thoracic cage. The thoracic cage is an unusual area. As I've mentioned um, in the tutorial, it tends to be a bit of an all or nothing body region. It tends to be one of those areas where people have a, uh, either virtually no injury whatsoever or they have a fairly significant injury, uh, in fact, life-threatening. When patients have a major trauma, about 40% of them will have a rib fracture, okay? It's a very, very prevalent injury, particularly in high-energy traumas. So we'll spend a little bit of time on the ribs, and it is a, an area where no matter what I say to you, I will be wrong. Okay, so what's going to happen is I'm going to tell you the, the rules and what I'd like to hear from you in an exam, but be completely aware that when you go out onto your placement, they're going to tell you every bit of advice I gave you about ribs is completely wrong. So here goes. All right, so first of all, let's have a quick look at some of the anatomy of the thoracic cage. What do we need to know? So we have got 12 ribs. Um, interestingly, here's a small side anecdote. As I say, the last time I was in this room was in 1992 when I was studying uh, radiographic uh, pathology and anatomy with Associate Professor Bruce Cook. One of the exam questions he asked me, I'm not going to be asking you this exam question, was he asked a true or false question and the question was this, men have one less rib than women. And for those people who are up to date on their Bible, you'd know where that reference comes from. And we all laughed during the exam, and then we just quietly leaned back <laughs> and did some gentle counting. It's amazing how much distrust you can have in your lecturers. Anyway, um, of your 12 ribs, ribs numbers 11 and 12 are floating. That is to say that they do not articulate directly with the sternum, but sternum they articulate with the ribs above them. You have your costal cartilage, that is your, uh, the, the medial most aspect of the rib articulation with the sternum. Now the costal cartilage is something which may not show up readily on an x-ray, however, in later parts of life, and I'm talking about the fifth decade onwards, roughly, um, it's quite, quite common for patients to get a calcification of the costal cartilage, okay? Very, very common for you to see this sort of feathery appearance of calcium in the medial aspect of the ribs. It's nothing to worry about. The only thing it means is that there's a little bit less elasticity of the ribs. So these patients are, are often a little touch more vulnerable to getting uh, some fractures there if they do receive a force there. <clears throat> and we have got our intercostal spaces where we have got our intercostal muscles which actually allow for the respiratory function. You'll occasionally hear the ribs referred to as being the true ribs and the false ribs. A true rib is one which directly articulates with the sternum and a false rib is any of those below that point. <clears throat> the spine, we should know all about our vertebra and we know that our thoracic vertebra have got our costovertebral junction so as to be able to have the ribs articulating with the thoracic spine. Sternum. Sternum is made up of three parts, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process, xiphoid means sword-like, it's just a little prominence that you should be able to feel in the midline, and the manubrium and the body of the sternum are the, the main bulk. The body of the sternum is where the actual ribs articulate. And we have our clavicles, the body region which breaks the at 90 degrees rule. All right. So we've got lots of joints within this region. We have got articulates between the sternum and the clavicle. So we've got our sternoclavicular joints. We have got where the ribs articulate with the vertebra and the sternocostals. I'll be covering this in the tutorial for those who have not yet seen this slide. The thoracic cage 
is a weird old thing because it has got a lot of different anatomical variations. So working our way through these slides from left to right, we have got a patient who has got a forked or bifid rib. You can see it bilaterally on that patient's um, 3D CT. And you can also see a patient who has got a depressed sternum, that is pectus excavatum. And the patient on the right has got cervical ribs, all of these being potentially important variants that I'd like for you to be able to recognise. Surface anatomy. So the, the awful truth about the surface anatomy of the neck, of the anterior part of the neck, is that it really does vary quite a bit depending between genders for a start and also from person to person. So essentially in the anterior part of the neck, we have got three prominences in sequence. So we've got our hyoid, thyroid, and cricoid cartilage. And I have never once, never, ever, ever been able to tell the difference between those three structures. So instead, what we're going to go for is neck lump, okay, which is going to be the prominence of where you would consider it to be the Adam's apple on most, but more prominent on males. But what we're going to do is we're going to be referring to that as being our cricothyroid area. We don't need to know about the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's not a strongly usable uh, surface anatomy structure, but one of the ones which I do want you to know about is your sternal notch. Okay, so anterior part of the neck, know your sternal notch. That's what you're going to be using for the majority of the time to be able to work out whether or not your patient is in a true AP position, for example. On the lateral part of the neck, well, this slide is similar to what you've encountered when we've had a look at the cervical spine. The three most common points of articulation are going to be your external auditory meatus, your ear hole, vertebra prominens down the bottom of your C7, and your mental symphysis, the tip of your chin. Now, one of the projections which I'm going to be talking about today is the lateral airways projection. The lateral airways projection is very similar to a lateral cervical spine projection. However, it does vary because the purpose of a lateral airways projection is not just to show the bones and muscular structures, but also to show the airway filled structures. Okay? So in the past, you have had the mindset of if you've included the ear hole, you've gone up far enough on a cervical spine. When we do airways, we're going to include a little touch more because we never quite know when some little kid has decided to put a bead or a button right up their nose. Okay, so we need to include a little touch more. <coughs> Anterior part of the chest. All right, so we have got midline structures. We have got our sternal notch superiorly and our manubrium inferiorly. Fantastic, so we've got two midline structures. In terms of lower down, we've got our lower part of our ribs. So we have got our lower costal margin. The lower costal margin, the bottom of the ribs, often actually quite close to the top of the pelvis iliac crest. And indeed, in some patients, there's a small amount of, of overlap there. All right. Clavicular anatomy. Well, you shouldn't really need to know too much about clavicular surface anatomy because the entirety of the whole thing should be relatively palpable in, on the majority of patients. Okay, so if you can't see the clavicle, you certainly should be able to palpate it. Positioning considerations. All right. So the first uh, piece of information I want to give you about uh, patient care and positioning consideration is this. This piece of information is anecdotal and has no scientific support, but on the other hand, it's true. Thoracic cage patients, and most particularly shoulder patients, faint a lot. I don't know why that is, but when you have a patient for a thoracic cage, and particularly for a shoulder series, <coughs> please be mindful of that. They are very likely to faint. If you had to ask me a second anecdote, I would say that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. I don't know why, but the moment that you have find some roid crunching 150 kilo footballer, they are just the most likely patients to fall over onto the deck, okay? So just do the appropriate thing, yell timber as loud as you can and take a step back, okay? So, um, 
be mindful of that. Please be aware that these patients can lose consciousness or have little vasovagals quite readily. When you have a look at a chest x-ray, one of the hardest things for me to get my head around when I first started looking at chest x-rays is I had a tendency to think that the ribs coming downward were the anterior. They're not. They're the posterior ones. Okay? I had, it took me forever to get my head around that. These angling down ribs are the ones that you're going to see most prominently on a chest x-ray and they are the posterior ones. Okay, The anterior ones you're only going to see to a certain point because then they're going to run into the uh, costal cartilage and it's going to have a much lower density. Okay, The posterior section of a rib is always going to be higher than the anterior section. So when ribs come off your spine, they curve around, and as they're coming anteriorly, they angulate downward. Okay, really important to know. One of the most challenging things I encountered when I first started doing chest and rib radiography was to actually count the ribs. It's a surprisingly challenging undertaking, particularly when your patient's not in a true AP position. Just a small amount of, of tilt forward or backward makes it a little bit harder to know which rib is which. So if you like, this is the Cameron way of doing it, okay? You might find your own technique, but here goes. Now, this x-ray that you can see in front of you there, it looks like it's been photographed of a photocopy of a textbook from 1970. So it's pretty average quality, but here goes. Hopefully you can see the outline of a rib here that I'm showing with the laser pointer. Okay, that's the broadest, fattest rib. Okay, that is rib number one. What I encourage you to do is to work your way backwards until you see the articulation with the spine. You know that's the first rib articulating with the spine. And then from there, you should be able to count your way down to the next one. And so you know that is the second rib. Okay, so orientate to the first rib, take it back to the spine, and then count down from there. That's about the best advice that I can give you in terms of being able to know which rib is which. I've got another slide um, of that which might explain that concept a little touch better, and I might include that in your notes for next week so it makes a little touch more sense. Radiation protection. All right, so couple of things to be aware of here. Um, rib fractures have a high correlation with trauma. Trauma has a tendency to be something which happens at a peak of the risk-taking years. So we're talking about the, the 15 to 35 age bracket. What do you know? Those are also the pregnancy years. So female comes in there with rib injuries. There's a decent likelihood that she's also going to be at a childbearing age. Be aware of that one. Otherwise, your principles are reasonably um, based upon the patient. Unless they have got some particular radio sensitivities, then you should just maintain good practices. Um, it's going to be hard to put lead over the abdomen meaningfully, particularly when you're x-raying the lower ribs. But if you're doing something like lateral airways and you have got a radio sensitive patient, then yeah, get one of those lead aprons, the, the lower half of a two-piece gown, <coughs> and then just hoik it up as high as you can. Totally okay with that. So. Fairly straightforward practices there for radiation safety. All right, imaging pathways. <coughs> when a patient presents with a possibly fractured rib, the most important x-ray is not of the ribs, but is of their chest to assess for a pneumothorax. Generally speaking, unless the rib is greatly displaced or there is a flail segment, I'm not tremendously concerned about the patient's ribs. I am concerned about the lung underneath. And so a chest x-ray is going to be the most important tool that we can undertake there. If there is a suspicion of a pneumothorax on this patient, we know that we should be doing an inspiratory and expiratory chest x-ray to confirm and to quantify the extent of that pneumothorax. So with a queried fractured rib, take a chest x-ray and then at the radiographer's discretion decide whether or not an expiratory needs to be done as well. If there's a clinical history of queried pneumothorax, then it's a good idea for you to just go ahead and do that x-ray as well. <coughs> 
okay? So if it's directed to do an insp and exp, do it. If there's a query pneumothorax, do it. And if you think they need it, do it, all right? And then from there, I've got a fairly vague uh, statement there of rib projection as needed. I'm going to talk about that more in a few moments. Otherwise, rib fractures have a tendency to, be, tendency to be clinically managed. Now, when we do our rib projections, there are a few reasons why we do it. One, we want to know if the rib is fractured in terms of the patient's treatment. Great. As I've mentioned in the tutorials, um, until just recently, uh, I didn't see many uh, platings or open reductions with internal fixations being done on ribs. But for some reason, in the last sort of five years, it's really taken off. And I've, I've seen more <coughs> people with rib platings in the last few years than I have in the 20 years before that. Obviously, a change to the way we manage these patients. Now, if you have got a patient who's got a fractured rib, yes, it's nice to know in terms of their management and to know about their risk of a pneumothorax. However, there is an additional clinical reasoning for doing a rib projection, and that is for a possible non-accidental injury. As I'll be talking about more in our pediatrics um, computer labs and tutorials, um, one of the reasons, one of the strong reasons why we do patients um, for non-accidental injury is not necessarily to treat their injuries, but to be able to definitively state that that injury exists so as to be able to get the best care of that patient and get them into a safer community environment that we can. Moving on to the sternum. The sternum is one of those body regions which kind of breaks the orthogonal rule. With the sternum, a PA or AP projection is pretty damn close to useless. You're going to have a superimposition of the sternum over the vertebral structures, so there's not a lot of point in doing it. However, we do need to be able to show an injury and to quantify it. With a sternum injury or with a queried sternal fracture, the lateral projection is by far the most useful one. Okay, because when you do have a fractured sternum, it's going to displace anteroposteriorly. Okay, it's going to crack from front to back. Okay, so that lateral projection is going to not just show you the injury, but also the extent of it. If a patient has a fracture to their sternum, as well as that lateral projection, so you're going to go in, do your lateral, yes, there's a fracture. After that, what you're going to try to do is to try to perform an oblique fracture of the sternum. Okay, uh, sorry, an oblique projection of the sternum, I should say, um, so as to be able to show it as close as you can to at 90 degrees. Great. Sternoclavicular joint injuries. <clears throat> when a patient has got an SC joint injury, the, the first projection that's ideal is to show a PA projection of the SC joints. However, in addition to that, one of the projections which is being done more and more frequently nowadays is the wonderfully titled serendipity projection, okay, which we'll talk about in a short period of time. It's, uh, a rem it's one of those views which uh, sort of dropped out of favour, and I don't know why, because it's really, really good and it's quite easy to do. So what I'd do is I would add in there PA of the sternoclavicular joints and then query a serendipity as well. And if the, um, if you need to, you can do obliques if, those imaging is, if that imaging is unclear. Now, I've said otherwise clinically managed, and that sounds like a very dismissive phrase there, but what I actually mean is then the patient is likely to go to CT to do, have a CT angiogram done because a sternoclavicular joint injury can lead on to all sorts of dangerous and nasty vascular problems. And the last area is our airways. We're a foreign body in the lateral airways. What you're going to do is you're going to do some investigation work to find out. You're going to find out the size and composition of that foreign body. You're also going to find out when it was uh, breathed in slash swallowed. And then you're going to find out the most likely pathway, whether or not um, a chest x-ray or an abdomen x-ray or both is going to be the most valuable way of imaging these patients. So the most likely way you're going to start off is with a lateral airways and then you may add in a chest or you may add in an abdomen but 
and particularly in paediatrics, a chest and abdomen is the most common way of imaging these patients. So we're going to talk about some routine projections and we're going to start off with the ribs and I'm going to start off with the topic where I will be wrong when you go out on placement. Here goes. Try that again. These images in front of you show two oblique projections. The gentleman on the left hand side of screen has got the anterior part of his chest closest to the image receptor, so he is undertaking an anterior oblique. The gentleman on the right hand side has his posterior part closest to the image receptor, he's having a posterior oblique. Now, when trying to work out which projection you should do of the ribs, I'm going to give you some principles to work alongside. Here goes. One, get the saw bit closest to the image receptor. That just makes sense. Second principle, the most common region of the ribs to be injured or fractured by far is in the mid axillary line. That is the lateral most aspect of the rib cage. The third principle is that you want to try to get that affected region as close as possible to being perpendicular to the image plane. All of those things making sense. But here's the problem. The more that you bring those lateral ribs, those axillary line ribs to the image receptor, the more you are putting your patient into a lateral projection. And that means you are superimposing the sternum, the spine, and the ribs on the other side more. So we have to try to find a happy middle ground. And generally speaking, the most common projection of the ribs tends to be the posterior oblique. The posterior oblique tends to be utilized more because it's comfortable for the patient and you can get a great amount of the surface area of the body, the surface area of the rib cage, in contact with that image receptor. Generally speaking, the amount of obliquity that you want is approximately 30 degrees. All right. So if I were to ask you in an exam, or indeed ask you in clinical practice, which oblique of the ribs you should do, I'd like you to answer in terms of your principles, okay? Get that body region as close as possible, and to oblique them enough to be able to show the structure without superimposing other structures, okay? Now, because a patient can have an injury over the entirety of that uh, semicircle of rib, so much of rib radiography is a real make it up as you go along sort of thing. Okay? And when you go out on placement, you're going to encounter radiographers and you're going to do your rib projection, and you might find radiographers who are way down one end of the spectrum, which is, no, you need to oblique them exactly three degrees more. That's going to be the only way to do it. And you might find other ones who are at the other end who go, eh, just do an oblique. The chest x-ray is the most usable one. Okay, so you might encounter strong opinions or anti-opinions on this topic. You will encounter radiographers who believe that the best way to image a patient for ribs is to magnify the ribs as much as possible. I don't see any advantage in this. Sure, the structure is bigger, but it's not as sharp, and so if you have got a small hairline fracture, you're not going to see it as well. Now this projection you can see on the left hand side, this is a patient who is in a right anterior oblique, but they're imaging the left side of the rib cage. I would not do this, okay? So I don't advocate that projection so much. I think that we should be trying to get the body region as close as possible to the image receptor. 
So, with that in mind, we're going to start off with the posterior oblique ribs because I think this is the most useful projection. In this particular image, we would be, on this gentleman, we would be imaging his right ribs. You'll notice that the centering point, that the crosshairs of the light beam diaphragm, is pretty much exactly over the patient's sternum. And that's okay because um, the amount of obliquity means that we're going to be getting most of those ribs flat against the film. So the obliquity means that that centering is not so bad. Now, my next vague statement goes like this. What is the centering point? All right, I'm going to give you two answers for that. I'm going to give you the textbook answer, and then I'm going to give you the real world answer. Here goes. The textbook answer says that you should, your central ray should be approximately five centimeters lateral to the sternum on the affected side, and it should be at the level of T7. T7 should correspond with approximately the top part of the body of the sternum. Okay? Now, that's the textbook answer, and now the real world answer goes like this. The way that we x-ray the ribs depends upon the patient's presentation. The first thing you're going to do is to talk to your patient and ask them where the pain is. As I say, in the majority of cases, it's going to be down that mid-axillary line. But one of the more important questions is to ask your patient if it's up the top or down the bottom. That is, is the majority of pain on the lower half of the chest or the upper half? That's important because that will dictate your breathing for the patient. If the patient has got pain in the floating ribs, that is, I'm going to make a more exacting answer here, if the patient's pain is at or below the ziffy sternum, we will undertake it in an expiratory phase. If the pain is or well, the point of greatest pain is above the level of the ziffy sternum, we are going to do it in the inspiratory phase. The reason for that is quite simple. We want to try to get a homogeneous background for those ribs. If it's the lower ribs, we want to get a big deep expiration to bring the diaphragm up and to display those lower ribs over the abdominal structures. Conversely, if the fractures are on the upper ribs, we want to try to get that diaphragm down as low as we possibly can to have those ribs be projected over the lung fields. And it's for that reason that my nominal MAS values here are listed as above and below the diaphragm, okay? So those are your inspiratory and expiratory values. But the more realistic way to image a patient's ribs is to ask them where they're sore, at what level and at what point and then to include either the inferior most ribs or the superior most ribs, okay? If the patient's my height, great. Well, a 35 by 43 portrait image receptor is going to be able to cover the entirety of it. <coughs> However, if you have got a, a super tall or super long thoraxed patient, make sure that you include either the 12th ribs up or the first rib down, and there is no doubt about your ability to count one way or the other to orientate which rib is which. Okay, So, yes, technically T7, but otherwise it's going to be the middle of the image receptor based upon where they're sore. All right, so sorry about that answer. It is a lit, little bit of a vague answer, but there you go. And undertake these with a grid. Okay, We need high contrast here for these images. And that's approximately what it should look like. Now... This particular projection, you can see that this has been, that the diaphragm is quite, quite high on this one, suggesting that this has been an expiratory <laughs> projection. We can only see about five or six ribs worth of lung there, okay? So it looks like they've shot for the inferior ones here. 
next statement. In the middle of your chest, you have a big old structure called the heart. The heart is fairly dense. Depending upon whether or not you do a left posterior oblique or a right posterior oblique, the heart will be projected to a certain extent towards the lateral part of the chest. Okay? Now, I'm going to work my way through this hopefully reasonably logically. Here goes. If you're trying to x-ray the patient's ribs, understand that the heart is, generally speaking, the apex of the heart points towards the left-hand side. In a left posterior oblique, the heart is going to be a greatly elongated structure. Make sense? In a right posterior oblique, you're looking almost down the, the barrel of the heart, from the apex to, to the body of it. For that reason, when you have a patient who has a right posterior oblique, you're going to have the heart over part of the ribs and lung over part of the ribs. Okay, So when it's right-sided ribs, you may need to do an additional projection on a different exposure depending upon where the heart sits relative to those ribs. Does that make sense? All right. Left posterior oblique, that heart's going to stretch way across to the periphery of the chest, and so you shouldn't need to do any additional projections. All right. That's about as well as I can explain the oblique ribs. Now, what should you do? You should include the region of interest. The first or the twelfth rib should be allowed for counting. Axillary ribs, that is the ribs on the most lateral most part should be shown as close to in profile as you can and the entire re region should be windowed well showing bony anatomy. So we're talking about a 70 maybe 75 kvp cap on these body regions. Now up comes at a projection which I don't like, the anterior oblique. Now this projection and what I'm saying here is this photograph shows the anterior region furthest from the image receptor. All right? And I don't agree with that principle. I think that when we do an anterior oblique, it should be for the structures closest to the image receptor. OK? So what I would actually be doing for this particular patient is when the patient's in this right anterior oblique, I would be centering about there. Okay, that is to show the right hand side structure. So I don't like the centering that they've done there. You'll notice in both the posterior and anterior oblique rib projections, I have said a 45 degree oblique. And realistically, that should probably be around about a 30 to 45 degree oblique, both for the anterior and the posterior. But the important take home message, the principle here is a degree of obliquity which shows that the rib section well and minimizes superimposition. Okay? So it is, by necessity, a variable examination because it varies on where the patient is sore. All right? And it should look, theoretically, similar to that. The criteria of ribs, regardless of if you do an anterior or a posterior, should be that you've got all that region of interest, show those ribs, axillary ribs, as close as you can to being in profile. The degree, obviously, of magnification might vary a bit. All right. So, patient comes in with a queried rib injury, do a chest x-ray, maybe do an expiratory chest x-ray, and do the rib projection which maximally shows the point of interest without superimposition. That's probably my best principles there. <coughs> RAO sternum. All right. Now, sternum oblique. When the patient's in a sternum oblique, it's a bit of a challenging projection because these patients often have got fairly considerable amounts of pain in their chest. And so 
in the majority of cases, particularly in a traumatic presentation, these patients are going to be done erect. As you can see from that inset there, it's possible to do them supine. And what you want to do is to put the patient into a 15 degree RAO. Now, when I say a 15 degree RAO, once again, let's go back to principles. When performing an oblique sternum, the objective here is to get it as close as possible to being an AP or PA. The objective of an oblique sternum is to project the sternum just off the spine. Okay? Now, if you have got somebody who has got a chest which is very, very slim in the anteroposterior diameter versus somebody who's a big barrel chested monster, the amount of obliquity will change. Okay? The more barrel chested, the smaller the amount of rotation. Okay? So as you have an increased distance from spine to sternum, you need just a smaller amount of rotation to project that body region off the spine. All right. So, the right anterior oblique of the sternum is considered to be the more appropriate view than the left anterior oblique because in the right anterior oblique, the heart is used as a filter, okay? So if you like the heart, the density of the heart makes a nice homogeneous surface on which to see the sternum, okay? And with the left, less so, okay? So the right anterior oblique is considered to be the better projection, but it's a small amount of difference, okay? Really small. Now. I'm going to show you an alternate method of doing an oblique sternum in a moment. And that it's a way that allows you to do one or both obliques of the sternum relatively easily. Now, this projection looks silly to start off with. However, if your patient has got a good degree of compliance, it can be quite valuable. Here goes. We have got an x-ray table here. We have got the long axis of the x-ray table, okay? And we can quite easily, with our tube, angulate one way or the other, up the bed or down the bed, all right? We've got our bucky tray, which we can displace inferiorly or superiorly as we need to. Here goes. Let's say, for example, you needed to do a couple of obliques of the sternum, maybe one, maybe two. You want to try to, if you've got a compliant patient, you get the patient to walk in to the side of the x-ray table. <laughs> and lean. Sorry about that, deafening up the back, gentlemen. And once they have leaned right over that x-ray table, you can then perform two obliques, an RAO and an LAO, very, very simply by just changing your tube angulation, displacing your bucky tray, okay? I would like for you in your upcoming lab next week to try a leaning over sternum, okay? It's not an incredibly common one. Literally, I've done it probably about a dozen times in my career, but it's just one of those handy views to know if need be. So, what are we going to do? We're going to do an oblique sternum. We can do our oblique sternum projections by having that small amount of rotation. I say a small amount because it depends on the size or the, or the shape of the patient's chest. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a 24 by 30 portrait image receptor. We're going to make sure that the top of the image receptor is certainly above the patient's sternal notch. Feel the zippy sternum. Okay, we've now got our superior and inferior most points of the sternum and we just make sure that we are that we've got the top and bottom of the image receptor showing those ones. One of the strangest uh, things that you have to get your head around when you are doing an oblique sternum projection is there is a certain amount of manhandling which you might need to do until you get used to the way patients look. So, for example, Zach, can I do a small amount of manhandling? So we've got our 
a wrecked bucky here and it can be hard from behind to know the ex amount of rotation I need to do and amount of movement of the patient I need to do to get the sternum in the middle. So what I'd suggest is, even if you're a shorty like me, is to have one hand on the patient's spine, one hand on the patient's sternum, and then to rotate it, making sure that the sternum hand is over the midpoint of the erect bucky. Okay? That way you'll know that the structure in question is going to be centred well. Okay? So, one hand on the front, one hand on the back, and rotate slash slide your patient so that the sternum is in the middle of your image receptor and by having one hand on the spine and one hand on the sternum you can also palpate find out the size of the patient's chest and that will tell you how much obliquity they need okay generally speaking um, they're going to be performed on an inspiratory phase. However, look, if it's a quiet day, your patient's not particularly radiosensitive, your confidence levels are high, your caffeine levels are good, you can try a breathing technique with your sternum. Okay? You've got to make sure that patient's sternum's right and tied up against the image receptor. But if you do a long exposure time, similar to a breathing lateral thoracic spine, those ribs are going to blur out really, really nicely and you're going to have a beautiful looking sternum. That's a breathing sternum right there. Just a small amount of rib movement, but look how sharp that sternum is there. You can see each and every scalloping of the uh, rib articulations there. Okay, so that's what it should look like. That's a really nicely done projection, most particularly because it has projected the patient's sternum just off the spine. This is the ideal objective, okay? Yes, it's an oblique, but it's so close to an AP or PA, it's not funny. So what should it look like? You should have the sternum superimposed over the heart shadow. You should show all of the sternum, and it should not be in any way over the spine. You should be having sharp, bony margins. It should look like that. So that's our alternate there, okay? Don't forget, offset the bucky, because it's really easy to forget that. Once you've tilted in one direction, to forget you need to displace the bucky for the alternate one. All right. The lateral sternum. <clears throat> the lateral sternum is the most useful projection of the sternum and should be the one that you do first. Center to the mid sternum. All right, so the top of the image receptor is above the jugular notch. Fantastic. You should make sure that the entirety of the sternum's on it. So 24 by 30 image receptor, you should be able to, for, for every person within 99.9% .9 of, of body presentations, you should be able to include the entirety of the sternum in a 24 by 30 area. Now, the centering point anteroposteriorly <coughs> I'm not even going to try to tell you. The range of positions of the sternum relative to the anteroposterior distance of the chest is highly variable. Some patients will have a pectus excavatum such that their sternum is a far more posterior structure. On the other hand, you will have patients who have got quite a prominent sternum such that their sternum is a centimetre or two anterior to the anterior most part of their ribs, okay? Generally speaking, and feel free to palpate away if you are so inclined, I'll turn my back so you can palpate freely, um, but um, you'll find that your sternum's about a centimetre roughly behind the anterior most part of your ribs, but for some patients it's more anterior, for some it's about even. Add in the difficulty of assessing the location of a sternum just by having a look at a patient, particularly for female, larger breasted patients. It can be very difficult to find that point. To that end, with regard to your positioning of the sternum, appropriately, professionally palpate. I want you to feel the patient's sternum. Only then can you have a good idea of where it is. Obviously, a sensitive area, do so professionally. Recognise that if the patient does have a sternal fracture, you are going to have to be super duper gentle. Okay? Now, 
one of the most important things that you can do for a sternum is to collimate well. Now patient sternums, generally speaking, curve out as they come inferiorly and then dip back in a bit when we get to the xiphoid or xiphoid. But some patients have got a concavity, some are really prominent convexity, some it's very straight. So what I mean is palpate the sternum and palpate the length of the sternum. Okay, because I want you to not just know the depth, but to know the curvature of the patient's sternum. The best and most important rule of sternal radiography is this, collimate tightly. Assess your patient's ability to comply, assess their ability to stay still, and if they're a compliant patient, please collimate, particularly with larger chested patients with lots of soft tissue because that soft tissue is going to compromise the image. Um, do you know how you were talking about um, the concavities? Yes. Um, and the really, is that more common in men or women? Because like, if you're like palpating women that way. Sensitive. Yeah, it's, yeah it, it is. It's one of those. Uh, so do they have it more than men? Men, uh, anecdotally, I have encountered it more in males than females. But physiologically, I don't know. I, I can't see a reason why it would be more prominent in... in I looked uh, at the literature, because I came across that in my practice with a gentleman, and um, it didn't have anything, and I was just wondering if you could... I've encountered more males with it than females. Um, I am now going to broach a topic which is something which I do so very, very... With trepidation, I want to make sure I say this professionally. Um, it can be very, very awkward to say to a, particularly a young female, I'm going to need to palpate your sternum because there's cleavage there, okay? And it means a certain amount of digging in the chest, okay? Yes, it's awkward. You are doing it for a professional reason. As I so often say, make sure you say to your patient, tell me if you feel uncomfortable, okay? Important that they f can express physical comfort and psychosocial comfort levels, okay? So that can be awkward, but it's, I would rather that you went through the awkwardness of the palpation than finding out that this, you know, young female patient has got pectus exuvatum and you've just completely cut off the bottom of the sternum and now you've got to re-irradiate them. So radiation safety, I'll stay off that topic now. Um, generally speaking, 100 centimeter FFD. Um, however, occasionally, if you've got a, a very, very long sternum patient, you can increase your FFD as you need to. Um, it's a surprisingly large exposure, okay? Particularly with females, you are going to be shooting through a fair amount of soft tissue, so please be mindful of that. Um, this collimation, I'm actually not really fond of it. It's not particularly good. Ideally, what the radiographer would have done is to have palpated. We've got the sternum, the, the top of the sternal notch is on there. Looks like the ziffy's on there, so that's quite good. Um, but the, the collimation, I would have liked to have seen something that looked approximately like that, okay? Rotate your light beam diaphragm to, to be parallel with the long axis of the sternum, and something like that, because we don't we don't need to see all this. This is a radiographer who's been lazy and just gone, eh, I, I think it's about there. All right, so. That, if, uh, as for those people who have been in my first tutorial, you would have seen the difference that collimation can make, okay, to that projection. All right. PA of the sternoclavicular joints, you are going to do this projection approximately three times over the course of your career. Here goes. Um, Sternoclavicular joints. When we don't do this projection very commonly for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, patients with sternoclavicular joint dislocations don't like being prone, okay? Second reason, patients with sternoclavicular dislocations or injuries in that area commonly have more significant injuries and they're probably gonna go and have a CT or a CT angiogram, okay? So this projection might be a follow-up lot of imaging. Um, this patient is shown prone, however, the majority of patients will prefer to have this done erect so that they are not resting their thorax's body weight onto that disrupted joint. 
Um, and what is it? It's going to be a very, very tightly collimated projection, about a 20 by 20 centimetre area. Um, and that's your starting collimation, depending upon how well you can palpate the patient, how confident you are, you can probably bring that in quite significantly from there. Um, and your centering point is going to be at the jugular notch. The jugular notch is going to be right up against the board, so once again it's going to be that hand on the anterior, hand on the posterior one to make sure that your centering point is correct, both supra-inferior and, and, and left and right. Um, and it really is just as simple as that. Now it's not going to be a particularly f beautiful looking projection because a lot of the time you're going to have a superimposition of the magnified spine over those SC joints. Okay, so it's not a great shot. This is only going to show gross pathology. Okay, for that reason it's rarely performed. What should it look like? Well, you should show the manubrium part of the sternum and the medial aspect of the clavicles. They should be as free of superimposition as you can, and that's really about all you can do. However, this projection is one that I would advocate. Now, <clears throat> there is a pretty decent chance, and in fact your next placement homework is to ask the radiographers if they know the serendipity projection. Okay? If they don't, be tactful about them not knowing it, because this is one of those ones which I really don't know why more people don't know about it. But anyway, here goes. The serendipity projection is an axial projection. That is, there is a degree of tube angulation. And it can be done erect or supine, but most commonly, once again, it's going to be in the erect position because the patient's going to be more comfortable with it. And all it is, is a cephalad angulated view of the clavicles and most particularly the sternoclavicular joints. The purpose of this projection is rather than a, a straight tube, which we saw in that last projection, superimposing it over the thoracic spine, we're just projecting it up a little touch more superiorly. So it's an AP projection, about a 40 degree cephalad angulation, and the objective here is just to throw those sternoclavicular joints up high so there's less stuff superimposing them. It's beautiful. Superimposing it over a smaller, thinner, weaker structure. And if the patient has got a sternoclavicular dislocation, we can see it really, really nicely. We should be able to see through these joint spaces really quite clearly. Come on, pen, work. All right, then don't. See if I care. Um, <laughs> it can be done on suspended inspiration or expiration. Doesn't really matter, OK? Um, but I have a tendency to do it on expiration. But that, that's a low concern. So it's a very simple projection, okay? You can do it supine or erect. This is what it should look like. You should have the manubrium and the clavicles included. And are you going to work, Pen? No, you're not. All right, fine. Um, if you can see through this joint space bilaterally, that's all I need, okay? Can be done with a breathing technique, but generally speaking, a suspended respiration is, is a more appropriate one. All right. Now, give me just a few seconds here, guys. Wow, I've got very little left. We're up to the one hour mark. Power through an early mark? Yeah. Power through an early mark. All right. This is another projection you're going to do approximately three times over the course of your career. This is the oblique of the sternoclavicular joints. This is a very tightly collimated projection whose only purpose is to show that sternoclavicular articulation. Generally speaking, this will be performed bilaterally. That is, that you're going to do a, an, a right oblique and a left oblique. Can be done with a patient in a semi-prone position or an erect position. And generally speaking, you're going to have that patient rotated 15 degrees. Once again, that 15 degrees is not a locked in number. It's a have a feel of the patient's chest and see how much you need to displace 
the sternoclavicular joint off the spine. Okay? If you start with 15 degrees, you won't be too far off. Our centering point is going to be level of the jugular notch. That's going to be the same level as the sternoclavicular joints. And we are going to be centering lateral to the midpoint of the spine. And we are going to be more centering on the raised region. Okay. If you perform this projection well, that's what you should end up with. Great. However, if you have got a patient who has, who's got one of these, who has got something like a follow-up of a sternoclavicular joint dislocation or something like that, realistically, one of two things is going to occur here. One, they're going to have a CT, because when a patient has a sternoclavicular joint injury, the underlying vasculature in great vessels tends to be the most important thing. Or it's going to be a patient who's reasonably ambulant, but they've just got a crackly joint or something like that. And in that set of circumstances, it might be worthwhile to do the patient with the leaning over projection so you can do those two obliques relatively easily. That's what it should look like. You should have one joint space being shown well. And now the lateral airways projection. The lateral airways projection is one that I'm going to spend just a little touch of time talking about. The reason I'm going to talk about this quite specifically is because it is very, very likely to be the projection well, one, it's probably one of the most useful projections I'm going to be teaching you today, but more particularly, it has a, a fair degree of patient interactivity and communication involved. And the final reason why I want to spend some time on it is because it is the projection which you are going to be doing this semester for your communication OSCE. So I'd love for you to know how to do this one really quite well. In your communication OSCE, we are assessing your communication skills. I am not particularly concerned about your technical skills, but obviously I want you to be able to technically perform this projection as well. So, here goes. <clears throat> In a lateral airways projection, I would like for you to start off with a lateral cervical spine. Okay, visualize that, and now we're gonna modify it from there. In a lateral airways projection, it varies from the cervical spine often for a couple of ways. First one is this. In a cervical spine projection, we encourage the patient to bring their shoulders down as much as possible. However, in the lateral airways projection, we often have the patient with their hands crossed behind their back because we want to try to posteriorly rotate the shoulders out of the way. I'm not interested in the bones on this projection. I'm interested in anterior most structures and so I want the shoulders down, yes, but I want them posteriorly as much as possible, okay? So holding hands behind the back, or even if the patient wants to put their hands on their side, but what you're going to do is you're going to tell them to, to push their chest out. So it's going to be this sort of shoulders back, chest out position. In terms of centering, yes, level of jugular notch, blah, 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 blah. That's not right. Instead, what we're going to do is this. I would like for you to put, and I'm going to give you some informal positioning here. Feel free to use this terminology in your exam. You will be marked right if you use the type of language. In a lateral airways projection, you're going to put the top of the image receptor to approximately the middle of the eyes. Okay? So if you put the patient's 24 by 30 portrait image receptor to the level of the patient's eyes, the reason why I suggest that particular one is because in the lateral airways projection, our objective is to show the airways. Don't get too focused on it just being the neck. We also need to show the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx, okay? And the nasopharynx can go up quite high. So by having the top of our image receptor at being at the level of the eyes, we're going to include all of those appropriate airways. Great. So, shoulders back, chin up nice and high. Top of the image receptor is going to be at the 
level of the eyes. You'll notice that the MAS that I suggest here is about 10, or by department exposure charts. Do not use an automatic exposure chamber for lateral airways. Because patients will move around a slight amount with this projection, it's actually kind of hard to stand still at a tension like that and not have a small amount of wobbling. And so if you use an automatic exposure chamber, a little bit of a wobble posteriorly is going to be a greatly underexposed image, a little bit too far anteriorly, it's going to send over spine and give you too much exposure. So a manual exposure is advocated for this. In your communication OSCE, I will have an exposure set for you. You will not be marked on that particular quality. So <clears throat> true lateral position, arms behind, chin up high, Centering point, middle of the image receptor when top of your image receptor is at the level of the eyes. FFD, 180 centimetres. If you want to use 100, I'm okay with that too. Have a look at the size of your patient. Okay, so that FFD, I'm not super concerned about. Some senders will say 180, some will say 100. I'm not passionate about it either way. However, by far the most important thing that you want to do is to coach your patient for the Valsalva manoeuvre. The Valsalva manoeuvre is something which, yes, I've already mentioned it in the tutorials, but if you haven't done your tutorial, we're gonna do it now, and we're all gonna practice it one last time just so we're all really, really happy with the technique. In the Valsalva manoeuvre, the objective is to try to get as much gas air as you possibly can in the patient's cheeks. Nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, trachea, Okay, you want to try to get that patient to push air down their throat. And to that extent, what you are going to do is you want to get the patient to, to trap that gas. Now, some radiographers will tell the patient to hold their nose to have a little practice. Here goes. The way that I instruct my patients to do a Valsalva maneuver is to take a big mouthful of air, you'll notice I haven't said take a deep breath in, but to take a big mouthful of air and then to puff your cheeks out and try to push that gas down into your neck. Okay, so it's this, please feel free to go ahead and do it as well. And puff those cheeks out really nicely. Now what should happen is if you do it with as much force as you can, you should almost feel as though there's gas going down your throat. Okay, if you're really <coughs> increasing the, the pressure there. That's what we want to try to do. Okay, now there are some radiographers who will say, pinch your nose and then take your hand away. If you want to do it like that, I'm okay, but I think it adds an extra step and adds a complexity which the patients don't need. Okay, so coach them. Okay, if you have got a patient and you are in any doubt as to whether or not they have done it correctly, have another practice. I don't care if you practice five times with them until you feel they can be trusted. The objective of the Valsalva maneuver is to shove lots and lots of gas <laughs> down into the patient's airways and the more gas that we can get down there, the greater the amount of contrast we will have if the patient has got a foreign body. Okay? We have a tendency not to breathe in pieces of metal so much, but beads and peanuts and stuff like that, which have got a density very, very similar to soft tissue, that's when we need to get maximum contrast, so we need lots of gas down there. Um, would it make people more susceptible to fainting? Yes. Yes, it can. Um, folks, if you're at home and you're wondering whether or not how much you can Valsalva, just take it easy, okay? Because not only does the Valsalva maneuver increase your <coughs> intrapharyngeal gas pressure, it also increases your intravascular pressure. You can go along and have a vasovagal. Don't do it, okay? Don't do this just for funsies, but you can mm, to the point where you just mm, and then everything goes grey, okay? I have, as I say, um, I have had radiographers describe it as, oh, my apologies here, take a breath in and try to poo but don't. Does, if that works for you, so be it. But yes, you can have patients who have got a decreased level of consciousness um, as a result of that. So once again, keep an eye out for the fainting 
patients there as well. Technically speaking, um, I do know of a case where a uh, patient who was super enthusiastic, not a, not in my practice, but a case study that I read, um, radiographer has gone, yeah, I really need you to, to go for a really big Valsalva manoeuvre, and um, they blew a trachea, they <laughs> ripped it, and um, had a extravasational leakage of, of gas into the soft tissues of their neck. So. Take it easy, folks, <laughs> okay? Um, how would you go about this um, projection on kids for people who won't really be able to follow the instruction? Welcome to your communication, Oski. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my flippant answer. Yeah. Um, while the valves, this projection, like if you have a look at a standard cervical spine x-ray, you, you'll see a reasonable amount of gas in there and you should have a reasonable amount of contrast, but um, so I'm going to answer you two ways, communication OSCE and then in the really real world. Communication OSCE, persevere, do the best you can for the patient. You're going to be marked on your ability to, to engage, to speak to the patient on their own terms, to get down to the height where that patient's going to be, to make it a, you know, a, a, a welcoming in, an environment for them, while still maintaining professionalism and control. So persevere. In the really real world, um, if you have a patient who has, who's a paediatric, well, if they're a one-year-old, don't bother. It's not going to happen. If you've got a three-year-old, can you make a game of it? Um, one of, I have a, a daughter. She's two and a half, right? And if there's only one thing that I've learned, and I think that's about right, um, about kids, it's that there's a huge vast range with kids um, and what works for one won't work with another, so you've got to be super duper flexible. I'll talk about that more in the paediatrics component. But if you have a patient who's developmentally delayed um, or something like that or has a, has a low cognitive skill, talk to the patient, have a brief conversation, assess their ability to communicate with you and then based upon that, have they got the, the cognitive stage of a five-year-old? Can you tell this 40-year-old man who, who has the, the capabilities of a five-year-old, let's, let's make it a game. We're going to be super puff-out cheeky soldiers. If that works, great. But talk to the patient is probably my best, <laughs> is probably my best answer. Basically, if we can't get them to Valsalva, then the best alternate is, let's say that you've got a, uh, a kid who's super agitated or a patient who's uh, got ETOH or drugs on board or something like that. In that circumstance, the best thing to do is to do a lateral cervical spine and mess around with the algorithm to try to get the maximum contrast. That's going to have a patient who's stable, still, and as compliant as you can probably achieve. So that's the that's the alternate, but it's one of those ones where that 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 extra few yards of effort can get some really nice imaging. You'll only be asked to do one. one. Yeah, one. you're. Yeah, or one side, and the, the side that you do will be up to you. So it's going to be written, so A, B, or P, A? Yes, yeah. I believe that your technical OSCE projections, I think, have already been included on Blackboard. If they're not, then I'll double check and put them up later today. Um, in the technical OSCE, there will be three projections performed by each, no matter what ball you pull out of the, the thing, all right? Um, lateral airways criteria, what should it be? Most important thing is I want to see lots and lots of gas, those airways maximally distended with air. There should be no uh, rotation, that is it should be a true lateral position as, as shown by those uh, straight lines of the anterior and posterior um, bodies there. And now the thing which I don't like about this projection is this, we have completely cut off some of the upper airways. That is, this projection would be unacceptable based upon that. I want to see 
something which um, my, no, no, my pen is just not going to work. I would like for you to Google images, lateral skull or lateral cervical spine, x-ray, and you will see that essentially what happens is you've got a roughly rectangular shape of your nasopharynx comes back, smaller rectangle of your oropharynx, they join at the back of the laryngopharynx and then they'll go inferiorly here. You can see the articulation where the uh, oropharynx and nasopharynx are articulating right there, damn me for being short. Um, but um, we need to include all of the nasopharynx because if this kid has shoved a tonka toy up his nose, there's no way we're going to see it. All right. Supplementary projections. This is a patient who has had a rib orif done. Um, as I say, rare thing, but they're becoming more and more common. What I would like for you to have a look at here is um, notice the outline of the patient's the contour of their ribs. The ribs are going out, 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 out. And it's kind of a deviation inwards here. What I don't know is if that's the way the patient's built or whether or not the patient has got rib fractures on the other side as well. Certainly, uh, I like to see my rib cage as a bell-like contour from top to bottom and it has a tendency to not have those sort of uh, concavities in there. So just be mindful of that when you are looking at your patient's ribs. Um, so, rarely treated with surgical fixation, but it is becoming more and more common. For the sternum, obliques are considered supplementary. They're technically challenging, and to be quite honest, a lot of sternal and sternoclavicular injuries are going to go to CT. As I mentioned in the tutorial, it's the vascular stuff underneath which is most, uh, of most value. Now, um, lots and lots of CT. Now, look, if you have got a patient who uh, is in a high level of trauma, you're not going to be asked to do rib projections, okay, because they're going to have a CT done. Probably the most useful projection that you can do of the thoracic cage, particularly on a patient, is going to be their lateral sternum, okay, because these patients are often going to be high energy MVAs. And so this patient isn't actually in the position for a lateral sternum. I will owe a Kit Kat to the person who can tell me what projection this is. Oh, dang, transthoracic humerus. Uh, well, thank you for your honesty. Yeah, this is a, a rare projection that rarely gets done. It's a um, humerus x-ray through the thorax in case you've got a high-level trauma. It doesn't get done very rarely. But I couldn't find a picture of a trauma lateral sternum. And I also should have put an image receptor in there. Um, but if the patient's supine, do a horizontal beam shot of the sternum. There you go. Um, common positioning errors. Okay, so ribs... Should you do inspiratory or expiratory? Should you do both? If you've got one at the level of the diaphragm, should you do both views to be able to show it? Maybe. Sternum, have you rotated the patient enough to project the sternum free of the spine? Very small angle. And have you coached for the valsalva? If you do those three things, though, you, the majority of your positioning errors are going to be done. Any questions about any of those things? Great stuff. If um, Amy Mallorca's here, I'd love to catch up with you. Um, Cassie, I'd love to catch up with you. And Joshua, I'd love to catch up with you. Two sets. Oh yes, absolutely. So yourself and also Jamie Fabu.
Thanks, guys. I got the recent, it's like there, and I wonder where it goes there. Okay. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I'm going to add the marks in so we can. If it's if you can't see the course materials within the next by this afternoon, actually within the next hour, pass on. No problem. All right. Yes, yeah, yeah, you emailed me about that. So did. basically we have got about three spots left. The plan goes like this. I am going to be catching up with Sue Pasco um, probably this afternoon or tomorrow, depending on her availability. Uh, whereabouts are you at the moment? Me? Yeah. I'll be here until three o'clock. Oh, no, I was in the, sorry, your placement. Oh, I'm at St. Vincent's okay. in Sydney, which really threw me because... Just Nothing like even near what you were. I know, I put all rural, yeah. and then allocations come out, and I sort of looked at it. So it's like the polar opposite of what I was hoping to yeah. get. Um, I might be able to find a rural one. At this point, I don't care. I, I do not care where it is. I just want the rural. I'm so pretty I sure. don't have to worry about it next year. Because right. my, my biggest issue is, if I have to go to Sydney, that's five weeks ago, take off of work, and then I still have to do again yes so that's more time so it's like that's what I'm thinking of here the most uh, to the best of my knowledge I think don't quote me on this but I think that there is a place available at Narrabri or Cots it was one of those two and there was either subsidized accommodation or free accommodation at that site at this time um, I think that that I can't see any reason why I couldn't earmark that for you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make the soup and find out the list. I believe that we should have a rule spot left, and I'm happy to give that one to you. So it'll all be best endeavour, but I believe that we can That's do it. That's fine. You just like that. That'd be great. Because like, and in the email too, when Sue contacted us about reallocations in early June, mm -hmm. the email was said you'd be in contact because you fit one of two criteria, yeah. and was even put no preferences down. Or you got none at all. Or, no, no, it was, um, or you've already done a rural. I think that's what it said to you. Oh, and I didn't fit into either of them. No, it should have I been. I thought really weird, and that's why I didn't respond to it, and that's why I was worried, and that's why that I That you wouldn't, do. would have fallen by the way, so no, I haven't forgotten me. You, you contacted me about that sort of not long after that yeah, email. Yeah. Um, bluntly, there were some things that we needed to allocate as a priority. Those have now been done. I'm pretty sure we're going to do Okay, cool. So, if you just let me contact me, as I said, any rule, I don't care this, I'll do it. If you have not heard from me by next Tuesday, you are to find me and slap me about until I give you a definitive <laughs> answer. All right? All right? Awesome. Thanks, Cameron. I'll see you in my apps. No worries at all. Fill it up. Okay. okay. Um, just a few things. Sure. Um, you sent me an email. Um, you wanted to check about two things, and I can't remember what they are off the top of my no, head. No, that's all right. Um, first one was because my placement will be in January to February. Yes. Um, ah, yes, on that yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. So, at the point where the exams are normally being done, fine, no problem. Keep okay, doing yeah. exams there. Yeah, yeah. However, your placement mark for 2160 is going to be an I for incomplete. You right. will have an I grade until such a time as your placement has been completed mm -hmm. and that your books have been marked and all that sort of stuff. 
Now, an I grade should allow you to still enrol in third year materials without any concern, so you should have every bit of access to uh, labs and tutorials and all that sort of timetabling stuff with no concerns there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, uh, I mean, I have no concerns about the passing or anything like that. So basically, it'll be an I grade. Yeah. It'll be an I grade for, and I'm probably going to guess here until about late January. Okay. Don't be concerned about that. Yeah. I put in a change of grade request uh, about two weeks ago and it literally got okay about two hours ago. Oh. So it can take some time because yeah. I have to put it in, it goes to the head of school, goes to the committee, goes to one other body and then it goes to the paperwork people who actually change it okay. on the computer. It takes some time. Okay. So don't be surprised about that. Yeah. So when it comes to those two days, I can't actually put anything in for like uh, the narrative or the clinical case studies? No. Okay. So all of your stuff will be marked by me yeah. when it's done. When it's so done. Yeah. what I'll do is I'm just going to find out the amount of time that I've given students in a regular placement mm -hmm. and give you an approximately equal okay. amount of time That'll as well. Probably later on. Yeah, so sure. let's say, you know, I'm grabbing numbers out of the sky, let's say you finish in January 15th, yeah. it might be January 30th that you need to hand in your materials and sure. stuff like that. So that's no great concern, it'll just be a temporary grade. Cool. You had another question. Uh, yes, that one uh, Nick yesterday answered for me, which was the lab, because I've heard you say after the technical OSCE, it won't be on. No, so the technical OSCE, um, everybody is assessed on the Monday, yep. and Nicole does the marking on the Tuesday. So there's going to be a timetable. Um, if I get an opportunity, mm -hmm. I'll ask people if they have a preference for a morning or an afternoon session, because I find that tends to be a little bit nicer than just going, hey, Eleni, you're at 3.15 p.m., you know. Um, so I'll probably put out some, some requests mm -hmm. for people, um, and I hope to, hopefully I'll get a timetable in the, the next week or so, so that people know when they are. Mm -hmm. It's a big day. I mean, you've done one before, a huge day. Yeah. Um, so we'll try to make it as comfortable as we can. Cool. Um, and then I've got two other things, sorry. Sure. Um, which is the 2160, I did the gatekeeper yesterday, but it won't allow me for like a return because I answered everything and it said I got 15 out of 16. I'm like, okay. I'll do. A, I'll fire up the reset material now, yep. or I'll just push you straight over and give you a 16. <laughs> either one's good, so I don't know. Yeah, I obviously either haven't clicked the reset button or the reset button hasn't worked. It literally, that quiz would not show up for people until yesterday afternoon. Yep. Why? Dunno. <laughs> just wouldn't. Okay, that's cool. Um, and yes, my communication and general competencies haven't been marked off. No problem. Bring them along to the you're in this afternoon session. No. In that case, that put them in front of you right now. Have you got a pen? Uh, yes, okay. And work work. And these ones. That's great. Probably. What about oh. you? Placement wise. Where oh, did you go? Sutherland Hospital. See this, that's your one to stick up on the board, I yeah. assume. And I'll tell you what you've got. your pocket there. <laughs> in front of me. Great stuff. Maybe put a little number two, hopefully, next to me. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, that's right. Which one's you got? Okay, um, it was all the communication. Oh, no, not all the communication. All the general ones. Yep. Um, and then five of the communication ones, which were these ones. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. you an email last evening. Yep. Um, you, no worries, Helen. I'll see you soon. Bye. Um, yeah. um, tell me what your thoughts are. Um, we've played for the quarter 